Colombia is a country located to the northwest of South America, bordered by two seas, the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. A country with a rich culture and diversity, where life, love, and faith play an important role. Despite this, Colombia has been the backdrop for an armed conflict with a reign of terror and criminal violence that has lasted for many years. Currently, the country is in the process of extricating itself from this long period of civil war. On September 26, 2016, in the town of Cartagena de Indias, the Colombian president, Juan Manuel Santos, and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC, signed a peace treaty bringing an end to the armed conflict that had lasted for more than 50 years. The FARC, a Colombian guerrilla group, was founded in 1964 with the aim of leading a war against the government in power in Colombia, leading to numerous massacres in various regions of the country. The challenge of the agreement is to get every rebel to lay down their weapons and join in the process of reintegrating society. At the end of the referendum on October 2, 2016, the Colombians rejected the agreement by a short majority because of disagreements on certain points in the negotiations. On November 24, 2016, in Bogota, a new peace agreement containing several amendments was submitted directly to the Congress of Colombia for approval. Can Colombia attain the peace that it is seeking? Several people who are committed to the process have spoken to us about their lives and talked about their work, demonstrating how Colombia is a country of hope and peace. Welcome to Colombia. This country has good people who have been educated in love who can contribute something to the world. These people must learn to believe in Colombia once again because eight years ago nobody came to Colombia. We feel happy when people show an interest in this country that is relatively unknown in the eyes of the world other than through the violence. And when people realize the beautiful things that we have in this country, that is so dear to me. To implement the peace treaty, all of the 7,000 fighters of the FARC were asked to go to one of the 26 demobilization camps spread across the country. After a period during which some had spent their entire life living a clandestine existence, handing over their arms began the process of reintegration to society. This new step meant some changes had to be made. Rural development, an end to illegal crops such as coca, process of participating in political life. It meant rebuilding a country where over 8 million people had been directly affected by the conflict. In a country like Colombia, those who know about the subject would probably recognize that the conflict has been going on for the last 200 years, that it reached its peak in the last 50 years, resulting in more than 8 million victims. Approximately 300 to 400,000 people died, most of whom were civilians. The people that suffered the most were those that lived in the countryside. A conflict on such a scale cannot but have an effect on the capacity of Colombians to trust. The signing of this agreement, which was negotiated over a period of four years in Havana, the capital of Cuba, also involved the entire Church of Colombia, whose primary concern was peace and reconciliation. In Colombia, there was a determination to end the armed conflict. 
And President Santos took risks in this regard. He received the Nobel Peace Prize as a result. But for the church, more needed to be done. It's not simply a question of signing an agreement. The church wants much more. The church yearns for a nation that is reconciled with itself and at peace. That is the greatest challenge. We have already succeeded in signing an agreement with the FARC. It was difficult, but we succeeded. Many in Colombia did not support it. The referendum failed, and the Congress accepted it. The important thing now is to keep moving forwards. How do we create the conditions that will promote reconciliation and forgiveness? It's a major challenge, and the Church has much to contribute. Initially, the faith of Colombia was the Catholic faith, introduced, of course, during the Spanish conquest, after which it became intermingled with our customs. But at the same time, some evangelical preachers arrived. And today, in a country of almost 47 million people, we have 10 million evangelical Christians, and the rest are Catholics, practicing or not. In Colombia, in Colombia, we can say that the Catholic Church is more present than the state. What does this mean? It means that there are some very good people, consecrated laypersons, nuns and priests, who are present where the institutions of the state are not present. This is evident, for example, with the FARC. Sometimes it is through the head teacher, a nun, of a small school in a very remote location, who commands authority and respect, and takes responsibility for the situation. Even the rebel chiefs, who are the fathers of the children studying in this small school, answer the demands of these teachers, of the head teacher. Those involved in the conflict, those who are armed, whether it's legally or illegally, turn to the Catholic Church and the church is always close by. I say this with great pride. When, in Havana, the guerrilla recognized the humanitarian work of the church, I think to myself, it is very good. We are doing exactly what we should be doing. The church plays an extremely important role in as much as we are going to get involved in every one of the 297 pages of the agreement, in the points of the agreement that were addressed last, and that led to the final agreement, which we are going to start implementing. This year will be a very special time where the church and the religious sector will play a very important role and will be the protagonists in the peace process. Luis Hernando Baron Ramirez and Duban Ernesto Barato Pachon are two Colombian witnesses with very similar life journeys. Both were members of armed groups. Luis Hernando, from the region of Caqueta, was a member of the FARC. And Duban Ernesto, from Bogota, was a member of the United Self Defenders of Colombia, a paramilitary group founded in 1997 to fight the FARC. Like every child when they're young, like so many others, I did not like school. <clears throat> My parents were married, but when I was five or six years old, they divorced. And this also contributed to the fact that when the time came, I became a rebellious child. I started to live for myself when I was very young, working, earning money. At the age of 10 years, I got my first firearm. I've always loved weapons because of the movies that I watched. And in 1994, I decided to join the FARC. After my military service, I worked here in Bogota like everyone else. And then I joined the National Police as a peace officer. This was in 1996. This is how I found out about the armed conflict in the country. 
What was reported in the press also when the guerrillas took a city, murdering police officers. As all these stories reached us, some began to feel a certain hatred for the guerrillas because we were convinced that the guerrilla was the source of the country's problems. So we began to build up resentment against all that. I joined the FARC in 1994. I volunteered. I approached them. And I asked to join. The person who got me in told me something like, talk with your father. If your father agrees, we can take you, otherwise it's no. And we will tell you all you need to know about the FARC. They explained everything about the FARC to me. What happens from dawn to dusk, what you do, how it's done, that you must ask for permission before doing anything, that you must obey orders. And they told me to think about it. I spoke to my father. My father told me that there was no problem. The next day, when I met with them again, I told them that there was no problem, that I wanted to leave for the guerrilla movement, and that's how I joined the FARC, at the age of 13, and began my life in the guerrilla movement. In the end, it was my decision. I found myself on the inside and I remained with the FARC for 11 years. In 1998, I was wounded in combat. In 1999, my father died in a massacre. He was murdered in a paramilitary massacre. In 2000, I found myself in prison. I got out two years later and I asked to join the guerrilla movement again. In 2005, I took the decision to give up fighting and to demobilize. I began to have some difficulties in my personal life, which meant that one day I acted strange and said, I don't care, I have to go there. The closest self-defense groups that I knew were those on the Eastern Plains. So one day, without talking to anyone, without telling anybody, I cleared out. I gave up my job in the police, my family, a daughter who was six months old at that time. On that morning, I took her in my arms, I kissed her and I said goodbye. I asked her to forgive me for what I was about to do, but I told her that I wanted her to grow up in a country that was at peace because I could not stand the fact that she could go out and be held prisoner by the guerrilla. So I left for the plains at Villa Vincenzo without knowing anybody. And that's when I started to become part of the daily routine of an armed group. So I said to myself, what have I got myself into? What am I doing? What will my family think? What will happen if I die? You start to think about lots of things, but there's no way of going back. Once you join the group, you have no choice but to stay. I had the military discipline. It was not difficult for me to adapt to this system. But I began to realize that the self-defense groups sometimes acted against the people. After spending some time with these two armed groups, Luis Hernando and Duban Ernesto managed to get out. Both are now working to integrate demobilized soldiers in society and helping to promote the peace process. I left in 2005. I took the decision to lay down arms and I started the process of reintegration. In 2006, I met with the Foundation for Reconciliation, where I experienced the methodology of the Forgiveness and Reconciliation Schools. I was given the opportunity to work as a secretary to the government. After that, I worked in the neighborhood in the juvenile prison as an educator. And then I was given the opportunity to work once again with the Foundation for Reconciliation in a reconciliation center at St. Cristobal of the South. That is when we started to work with communities and families using the methodology of the Schools of Forgiveness and Reconciliation. We work with abused women who've been raped, with young people, fathers, with the teachers themselves. We are also setting up areas for experimenting with restorative justice. I 
I wasn't aware of any solid political proposals by the self-defense groups. There were none. Their way of speaking was, we're going to bring down the rebels, we're going to end communism. I think that being in this part of Plains enabled me to come to another realization. It made me aware of the reality of the countryside, the reality of the indigenous peoples who were forced to run to escape the guerrillas, the self-defense groups, or even the army itself. In 2003-2004, I made the decision to leave the group. I deserted. Running the risk of becoming a military target, they would have killed me if they had found me. Well aware of what I was going to have to face, rejection, being stigmatized and looked at by society, I began by finding my family and telling them, you see what situation I've been in? At first, it was very difficult for them to accept that their son, their brother, their father was part of an illegal armed group responsible for so many deaths and so much destruction in the country. I began to free myself from my anger and my faults and to put myself in the place of other people. To forgive myself for all the things that were in the past. Abandoning my daughter. The distancing from my family. Many things that were emotionally quite difficult. There I had space to be able to be healed of all this. I was able to think about my plans for my life. My project is called The Foundation for Recovering the Conscience and brings together all the experience of those who have been directly involved in armed conflict. God, in his infinite wisdom, knows how he is leading me. We're seeking ways of working. We're about to come to Villa Vincenzo to bring a better quality of life to people. José Ricardo Tafour who was born in Gerardot, is now city management consultant in Gerardot, and was formerly deputy to the Assembly of Colombia and president of the Chamber of Commerce. He was sequestered by the FARC in 2001, another victim of this armed conflict. The truth is that the experience of being sequestered is one that leaves a definitive mark on your life and changes it completely. I was sequestered in 2001 by the FARC when I was in one of my family's properties in the department of Tolima. I was sequestered for three years. I came out in 2004. It was an experience that made me realize that war is definitely the worst thing that can happen to a society. Despite the difficulties of the sequestration, José Ricardo, thanks to his faith, gradually gained the respect of the rebels by teaching them to read and write, and especially by sharing the gospel with them and the existence of a loving God. During the first few months, I had no contact with the guerrilla troops, but over time, I began to read. Of course, I was in chains, and when we went out to walk on the pass of the Cordillera, they tied us with a rope to keep control over everyone who was there. Time passed, and one day the rebels realized who I was, someone from their own town and region. So they changed the bad way they treated me and invited me to teach the troops to read and write. As teaching was my vocation, I volunteered to teach the children affected by the war who were with me in the camp to read and write. They wanted to learn, 
I put down my conditions. I told them I would teach them to write the way my great aunt had taught me my first letters. A beautiful card that said, I love my mommy, my mum loves me. So I began to talk to them with the language of love, the language of home, the love of a mother, the love of family. They were children of the war because they were from families that had been completely unstructured. Children who had only known violence in their families. We began to talk about love and forgiveness, and in the end, they asked me to read to them what I was reading. I often read the Bible. Then they asked me to explain to them who God was for me. Because even when I was angry, I did not scream or run away. I would simply hold on to a tree because I didn't carry arms. I asked God that if it was the moment to leave, I would go, but for everything else, that he would protect me. People who had been wounded during the air raids fell around me, but they saw that I continued to believe in life. The God in whom I believe is everywhere. But how can you explain to rebels, to fighting men, fighting men and women, that God is everywhere? Then I remembered that they were all radio operators. So I asked them, who knows how to handle radio telecommunications here? They all raised their hands saying, we are radio operators. Okay, so you know what the radio spectrum and the electromagnetic spectrum are? Of course we know where the radio waves and frequencies go. Well, God resembles an electric radio and the electromagnetic spectrum. Because this God who is everywhere, what he needs is that we open our hearts to him. The heart is like a radio receiver, and he communicates with this receiver. I gave this explanation, these examples, and they understood. It was a beautiful testimony, but the most beautiful thing was when I came to the end of this time of sequestration. At the moment when I returned to civilian life, one of the rebels said to me, my friend, Leave me your Bible. I want to carry on reading and getting closer to this God who allowed you to spend three years at the heart of the fighting and then to regain your freedom. Vilma Rosa Soler, who was born in Barranquilla, is a doctor by profession. In 1990, she moved to Girardot, a town in the middle of the country. In 1999, the FARC seized the town of Villarica causing the deaths of many people and destroying almost the entire city. Vilma Rosa witnessed these events. I heard on the radio that Villarica, the village where I had been, had been taken by the guerrillas. It was six o'clock in the morning when I heard this news. It hurt a lot because I had so many friends there. I arrived at the Girardot Hospital and immediately asked my boss, who was the director, for permission to go to the village and help the people. He said yes and helped me bring medical equipment and everything that was needed for the village. So that day, we left for Villarica. I found the village completely destroyed, devastated by the flames. It was raining, but despite the rain, the houses were still on fire. The people in the streets were completely disoriented. Some were wounded and hadn't received any treatment. The doctor wasn't there that day. He was in the countryside and wasn't at a hospital when the town was taken. I was very shocked to see this suffering in this beautiful village, a village full of good and joyous people, people who worked hard. I was so upset that I began to go from house to house to ask if anyone needed help. 
I believe this experience left such an impression on me that it affected the whole of my professional life. I really believe that this was the basis on which I continued to practice my profession and to commit myself with a real will to study harder every day in order to become more competent at my job. I know that I owe all to these people who are so brave. Many associations and organizations for peace have sprung up during these last 50 years of conflict. Organizations for reintegration, started by young people, that work for a better society. One such case is the Central de Juventudes, a center which trains young people from across the country to become peace leaders. La Central de Juventudes the Youth Center works for young people. It was founded in 1953 by a priest named Father Luis Maria Fernandez Pulido, known as Pafe. The Youth Center is a work of love for young people, for the church and for the laity. We want to promote forgiveness, healing and reconciliation as essential factors for peace. If you can forgive, if you can heal, and if you can be reconciled, there is peace in your heart. And if there is peace in the heart of a person, a change is possible. The Bible says, justice and peace embrace. That's why we think that this work of love is to meet young people and bring them to Christ. Encountering the forgiveness of Christ in this way, they will receive the healing that Christ gives them. And they will be able to reconcile with their brothers and with the church. This is the driving force of change which leads history. Here we implement all the formative experiences that help a person to grow and to meet the Lord. In this sense, we contribute greatly to peace. In fact, simply searching to find out what my mission might be here and being able to consider and value a person through little things, simple things, is to start to change things. It is seeking peace. If I buy a guitar and I only play it for myself, this won't bear as much fruit as if I buy myself a guitar, learn to play it, and then make myself sing or perform in front of others. So these others feel something and are moved, woken up, think or love, thanks to a song. This is peace. This country needs people who don't just do politics, but people who work as citizens, as citizens committed to others. With this population, or rather these people, who need a smile on a daily basis. For me, peace is fighting for what I have, fighting for my dreams. It's walking every day without fear of falling, and even if I do fall, getting up again. May God be my strength, and may others see peace in me. This is the most important thing. Jesus said these beautiful words, You will have tribulations in this world, but take heart, I have overcome the world, and as I have overcome, you too will overcome. This is our hope, this is what we believe. There are over 8 million victims in Colombia, including thousands, hundreds of thousands of dead, and battered families, and some of them are full of vengeance. There's still a desire for revenge among some, but for most, there is a hope for peace, a peace which says, I want to forgive you.
Letter of St. James, chapter 3, verse 18. True justice is the harvest reaped by peacemakers from seeds sown in the spirit of peace. Lord, we pray for the peace process in Colombia. We pray for all those who have been victims of the civil war and for all those who have done evil, that a deep reconciliation can enable the country to rebuild itself in unity, that the commitment of Colombia's people to peace can also be a source of hope for all those who are working for peace, especially in countries that are currently experiencing armed conflict.